All right. Then we want to talk about kinesthetic development. So if we think kinesthetic, um, kin kind of referring to the body, this is our sensation of touch and our proprioceptive systems, vestibular systems. Like kinesthetic is just pretty much like just body awareness. And there are a lot of different balance systems that could be incorporated into kinesthetic sensation. Um, oftentimes kinesthetic sensory system or proprioceptive system are interchangeable and they tell us where our body is in space right also looking at where certain body parts are in relation to each other how our body is moving what direction body parts are moving in and then also we can look at the nature of objects the body comes in contact with our kinesthetic sensory systems are relatively mature by about age three but perception continues to mature throughout the adolescent phase, and a lot of this comes with, if you think about uh, babies, we say, oh, the more space they have to crawl around in, the better, because the more tactile cues they get from different textures of surfaces, the more shapes they get to interact with, right? And that's a direct kind of transfer of their kinesthetic sensation to how they perceive what's going on around them and what's going on in the environment. So there's different parts of kinesthetic sensation. There's a somatosensory system, which is uh, differentiated proprioceptors that are going to relay information from stimuli applied to our muscles, tendons, ligaments, skin, right? And they provide us the ability to make postural adjustments based on stretch detected in muscle tendon apparatuses. So um, you guys might have heard of muscle spindles in exercise physiology. These are really integral in stretch reflexes. So muscle spindles are made up of the intrafusal fibers that lie in the center of the muscle belly. And there are different types of afferent fibers that can detect the speed of uh, muscle lengthening but also detect the magnitude of muscle lengthening and based on the information that we get in those afferent sensory organs right we can send that information to the spinal cord and then send a responsive either inhibitory or excitatory message uh, to efferent neurons that are going to elicit some type of motor response that might sound familiar to you guys in terms of like a knee-jerk reflex or a reflex arc Okay. We also have Golgi tendon organs, so these lie within the tendons of muscles, and they are going to be more sensitive to changes in force, um, whether that's external force applied by an object, um, or it could be internal force that's produced by the muscle in response to that object. We also can detect temperature changes via cutaneous receptors in the skin. Also, with these are nociceptors that are going to sense pain. <laughs> or we can use a lot of these other mechanotype receptors. So, um, Ruffini endings, Golgi type receptors, modified pancinian corpuscles. These are all mechanoreceptors. Are, 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 they're located both in joint capsules and ligaments, but they're also, some of these are also located in the skin or kind of the deeper tissues of the skin, and they're able to sense pressure changes. So if you were standing with your um, eyes closed, right, you kind of know in your feet where your weight is placed based on the, the stimuli that each of these pressure receptors gets at certain areas of your feet, okay? We also have the vestibular system which has differentiated proprioceptors that detect stimuli in the inner ear. I think we have a picture of the inner ear coming up when we talk about auditory sensation, but you guys should know based on your cranial nerves that you have a vestibulocochlear nerve. Your cochlear nerve goes to your cochlea part of your inner ear that's responsible for um, uh, reacting or sensing sound waves and then you also have your semicircular canals or your vestibular nerve that goes to your vestibular system right and these circular there's three canals that face in different directions and they're able to detect movements of the head in relation to the body 
different horizontal or vertical accelerations of the head with respect to the body. Their vestibular system is actually really, really, really important in terms of balance and knowing how you are oriented in space relative to the orientation of your body. But using these two systems, we can implement feedback and feedforward systems to both adjust related to feedback and prepare or anticipate different types of postural perturbations or um, maybe how we might interact with an object in the environment. In terms of perception, we can look at tactile localization, manipulation, and movement. So tactile location is a person's ability to identify without sight, right, the exact spot on the body that has received touch. So I think this is a lab procedure done in one of the, the, the physiology labs. At least I did it when I took physiology at Long Beach. Um, but there's a, a test called two-point discrimination or a threshold discrimination um, where you take uh, some ruler or measuring unit and you have two very thin points um, and then you change you can t you start with them um, wide apart and then figure out what distance apart you know you you can sense the touch and then you keep moving the little points closer and closer together until the person says like oh I feel that as a, a single singular touch point, right? And that's our two point discrimination. So usually that discrimination is fully matured between six and eight years old, but it's also going to vary in different parts of the body based on how far apart our receptive um, or our receptors are placed throughout the skin, but also how large receptive fields are for different types of receptors. So if you think about it, our feet and our hands are in contact with a lot of different things and understanding where we have points of contact on those surfaces is really important in control of movement and balance and if we're reaching or grasping an object, how we control that object in our hand. So when you do two-point discrimination on high contact surfaces, usually you're going to have a very, very, very sharp kinesthetic perception of that tactile location. However, on different parts of your body, say if you guys did the two-point discrimination on your back um, or on a part of your thigh, it might not be as acute, right? Or your sensation or perception of that touch might not be as acute. Manual exploration is important for tactile recognition, um, and it helps with the development of haptic also known as cutaneous memory and object recognition. So this is where, why we encourage infants to handle different objects, right? Um, to understand what shape feels like, what the weight feels like, textures, um, but specifically their ability to recognize different objects without using visual cues. Okay, that way we know it's a true kinesthetic perception and not influenced by vision. We also know that perception of movement improves up to eight years, and this is largely related to a person's ability to reproduce a movement that has been observed or reproduce a movement that has been executed on their body. So some studies that have looked at this will tell a person to like close their eyes or they put a person's arm underneath the table. You guys could actually do this um, as you're seated at a desk, but if you put one arm, if you close your eyes, put one arm under the table and then take your other arm and try to place it on top of the table such that it would be stacked with your other arm, right? Without vision, that's the important part, right? How well are you able to reproduce the position of your arm under the table with the arm on top of the table? There's also studies that will have people close their eyes and they'll place the arm in a certain position, could be a mixture of shoulder flexion and elbow flexion or whatever, right? They put their arm in a certain position, tell the person to relax, and then ask the person to replicate that movement. So those would be examples of reproducibility of movement in kind of a measure, measurement of someone's kinesthetic perception. We can also measure kinesthetic perception by looking at body awareness or a person's uh, ability to identify certain body parts. 
Most people can correctly identify major body parts by the age of six, um, but practice is going to play a large role in learning this. So things like, or games like the hokey pokey, right? You put your right foot in, put your right foot out, <laughs> okay? Um, and kind of helping them to understand what their body parts are is really important. I know, actually, I had pretty advanced knowledge of um, major body parts by the time I was, like, two, I think. And my mom would always give me a stuffed animal, and she, I think we had a Simba doll, or, like, a st Simba stuffed animal. It was my sister's, but I would steal it occasionally. And my mom would say, like, where's Simba's nose? And I would, I would point to his nose or where are his eyes? Right, so different activities like that can be really helpful if you're trying to develop um, a person's sense of kinesthetic perception, understanding body parts, and then, you know, my mom would say, okay, that's Simba's nose, where's your nose? And then I'd have to point to my nose, okay? So practice is going to be, um, or play a huge role in learning the correct identification of body parts. We also can consider spatial dimensions, so up versus down, front versus back, side versus side, okay? Um, usually these spatial dimensions will develop in this order, um, and they first develop on a, on a person's single body, and then they are generally able to apply this to other bodies as time progresses. So Simon Says is kind of like a, a good example of body part identification, but it also can be good in terms of spatial dimensions, because if you're mimicking a person, that is a kind of an inability to distinguish between side to side movements. So if someone says, put your left hand on your right shoulder, <laughs> right, and you mimic them by putting your right hand on your left shoulder, that is an inability to distinguish spatial dimensions side to side, right? Um, but I think side to side movements are a very clear difficulty as we progress with age because a lot of kids who are still like age six through eight still have a hard time distinguishing left from right. Um, but up and down, front to back, those ones kind of, they catch on to pretty quickly. And then I hope, uh, these dang videos. All right, I'll have you guys watch these because um, they should work in your PowerPoint and I was hoping they would work in mine. So this is self-awareness. Most individuals are not aware of themselves before the age of two, but usually by the age of two, you will get, no, this is so sad. Okay, dang it. I was hoping it would work. It might be that my recorder is interfering with this, but um, it's really funny to watch. Uh, you have these little kids, they're, they're placed in front of a mirror. That's the mirror test. And then basically what happens is you put a, like a red dot on their face or like on the middle of their forehead and they have to understand like, oh, that's me, you know. Anyways, it's a, it's a really cute video. I would recommend watching it. I have another video on the rubber hand illusion, which is also a funny video. Uh, if any of you have ever done this, it's quite, yeah, it's. It's quite funny. This guy kind of sits on like a pier or boardwalk and messes with people. But it's a good example to show how self-awareness can still be altered into adulthood. Rounding out here pretty soon. We can also look at body awareness in terms of laterality, right? Lateral dominance and preference. So I think some of you might have been thinking like, ooh, side to side movements, right versus left, right? That we can describe as laterality or the awareness that the body has two sides and that those sides move differently in relation to each other and in relation to different body parts. So that awareness usually develops around four or five years old. Again, it's not refined. Um, or we don't have a sound ability to discriminate between sides um, until about age 10. So that's why kindergartners through I don't know, third, fourth grade, if I'm getting my ages right, usually have problems with right versus left. Lateral dominance, however, like if you're right-handed versus left-handed, usually you can have hints on that as early as three months. 
Um, but hand dominance is usually pretty concrete by the age of four. The reason why we can't really understand hand dominance um, super, super early on is because, if you guys remember when we talked about uh, bimanual tasks or the development of using our hands either together and, and kind of distinguishing independent movements or complementary movements from hand to hand, there's a lot of changes in uh, different periods where we might have more unimanual tasks versus man or, uh, bimanual tasks, and then where we switch between the two. So uh, usually by the time someone hits the age of four, you can kind of understand what their lateral dominance or what their side preference would be. Side preference, however, is slightly different from dominance. So dominance is just like what side of the body do you tend to initiate with more? Side preference, dif you, you can have different preferences or side preferences for different body parts. So the side with the majority of preferred body parts indicates the more dominant side. Okay, so some people might say like, uh, for dance, I think this is a good example, where I like to balance on my right leg, right, and I'm actually right-handed, um, but my left leg, as you're using it as a gesture leg, is a lot better than if I was using my right leg, right? So those are two different examples of preference, but again, the side that has the most preferred parts usually determines the dominant side. If preferred parts are all on the same side, we call that pure dominance or pure preference, basically. If preferred parts are on both sides, we can call that mixed dominance or mixed preference. Okay. But preference, the sum of preferences, kind of determines a person's lateral dominance, if you want to think about it that way. Uh, we can also consider spatial orientation, so the perception of a body's location and orientation in space independent of our vision. That's pretty much well defined by age eight. So you can test spatial orientation by trying to walk in a straight line, but uh, while being blindfolded, which I think uh, that like generally is a pretty good test. <laughs> Some people might say like, "Oh, this is bad because I already have bad balance and like can't walk in a straight line to save my life, even with my eyes open." Right? But again, using or kind of. Using these tests that don't allow you to use vision gives you a pretty good idea of a person's total kinesthetic perception instead of being influenced by vision. So that's well defined by about age eight. And then we also have directionality, which is a person's ability to project the body's spatial dimensions into surrounding space and to understand movement or locations of objects in the environment. And this is usually developed by age nine, but there are some refinements that continue through adolescence. So an example of this would be like if this little girl is sitting next to her dog, she understands that the, di the spatial dimensions of her body are and, and how she she's able to relate those to the dog's spatial dimensions. So uh, I guess a better example would be like if you are facing a person you are able to understand that the left side of their body is aligned with the right side of your body, right, and vice versa. Understanding direction relative to other objects or other environments um, that are kind of interacting with you as a person. Kinesthetic changes with aging. Some adults will experience detriments in cutaneous sensitivity. This is just a video of an old man dancing. It's kind of cute. But they might lose cutaneous sensitivity, uh, vibratory sensitivity, sensitivity to temperature and pain, proprioceptive acuity for both static and dynamic movements. So kind of think about all the different skin receptors that we have and uh, all of the pressure sensors that we have um, in different parts or anatomical locations. If any of those receptors die or if they're damaged in some way due to aging of tissues and they don't exist anymore, that means our receptive fields are going to shrink. 
right? And if we have gaps in receptive fields, that means we're going to have detriments in performance. So um, usually when we have these kinesthetic changes due to aging, there are concerns for balance and stability during daily activities, which is why we typically give individuals walkers and whatnot. But this is in addition to all of the other aging effects that we've talked about in terms of body systems and aging of tissues. So lots of things that could be contributing um, to balance and stability, not just kinesthetic changes, but there's not a whole lot of research in this area that we have to discuss on this. 